Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. So happy you are here. My name is Vanessa Black. I'm one of the owners and founders of Billionaire Ret, where we are on a mission to impact the lives of billions, four billion to be exact, people's lives all over the world to achieve personal and financial freedom by developing their minds, their bodies, and their souls. And I'm so happy that you're here because we are continuing to dive into this phenomenal, phenomenal book by Tony Robbins. It's called Life Force. It is his newest book out and the information in here from the top doctors, the top people in the health industry that he has interviewed, he's collaborated with to create this book and provide it to us is absolutely phenomenal. The information has been amazing. If, if you've been joining us on the past Read With Me sessions, you know what I'm talking about. Who's excited? If you are excited, let me know in the comments. We're learning about what aging really is, about all the newest technologies that are out there here today, like not 30 years from now, what's taking place today to prevent so many of the top disease killers that are out there to just prevent aging in general and to literally reverse aging. That's what we're talking about here. So if you're looking to reverse aging, live extremely long, but not only the, the amount of time, but feeling amazing as well, then you are at the right place and at the right time. And if you know anybody in your life, anybody that you're surrounded by in your circle that is you feel would be interested in the same exact thing and you want to live long with, then go ahead and share this video with them, share this book with them, whether it's a physical copy, this particular audios or both. We want you to actually take this information, understand it, know what's out there so you can be able to gift this to yourself and your loved ones. So you never know when you're going to need this information. And the beautiful part about it is we are learning it right here, right now. So let's dive into chapter five of this amazing, amazing book. It is called The Miracle of Organ Regeneration, this particular chapter. And again, Life Force, the number one New York Times bestseller, Tony Robbins here. As you can see, it's a pretty big book, but we are almost halfway. <laughs> so congratulations, those that continue to keep showing up and have made it this far. Let's continue. Let's dive into it. Chapter five. It is on page 124, 123. Alrighty. The miracle of organ regeneration. If we keep cars and planes and buildings going forever with continuous maintenance and an unlimited store of parts, why can't we create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs to keep people living indefinitely? Martine Rothblatt. The decade ahead will be known for many dramatic health advances, but few will be more astonishing or impactful than this one. We may each soon have access to a set of, up, set of backup organs. Today, the transplant waiting time can be years, which for many people, might as well be never. But what if people didn't need to wait for someone to die before they can get a healthy kidney or health or heart or liver? In this chapter, you'll learn how five brilliant scientists and entrepreneurs are taking on the gargantuan challenge as we speak. Here are just a few of their stunning advances. Dead and damaged lungs can now be restored and preserved in good condition for up to 22 hours, enough time for them to be flown out for transplantation with a 100% success rate. Another stem cell-based platform, 3D printed organs, a 20-year-old technology is fast advancing from skin and bladders to solid organs like hearts, kidneys, and lungs. The ultimate payoff projected before the end of this decade will be an unlimited supply of safe and affordable on-demand transplants with the finished product available within a month of the order being placed. Humanized genetically modified pigs could provide more than enough off-the-shelf organs for everyone on the transplant list with no risk of viral contamination or a life-threatening immune response. The transplants might even be stronger and more resilient than our original organs. 
Yet another organ regeneration platform is rebuilding lungs from scratch by combining a pig collagen scaffold with the future recipient's own stem cells with perfect DNA matching between the patient and the regenerated tissue, there's no chance of rejection and no need for lifetime immunosuppressant drugs. Our lymph nodes can be turned into bioreactors to manufacture mini organs to support or replace diseased originals. On-demand cyborg kidneys, synthetic scaffolds infused with stem cells can generate normal urine and are targeted to be tested in human patients by 2023. Plus, as you read this, you'll learn principles that have guided these inspirational scientists to create breakthroughs in areas where the task seemed impossible. As you read, notice the patterns they use to create these breakthroughs because you can model their beliefs and actions to solve your own challenges or to achieve goals that might initially seem impossible. I know this all sounds like science fiction, but Dr. Anthony Atala of Wake Forest University has been using stem cells to grow 3D printed human bladders for almost 20 years now. <clears throat> and there are people today whose lives have been saved and transformed through his work. Most of what you will read about in this chapter will be coming to the public between the end of 2022, that's this year, and 2025. So let's begin the journey of all the brilliant people and Roth Bolt, the chairman, CEO, and founder of the United Therapeutics, or UT. The quality and scope of Martine's thinking, the depth of her curiosity, the passion of her execution. She just gets to a different level than anyone else. <clears throat> She's become a friend of mine and has been a close friend of Peter Diamandis for more than 30 years. When Peter and I recently caught up with her for an interview, what I, le what I learned left me in awe. Read on, and I'm betting you'll feel the same way. United Therapeutics is changing the game with a multitude of operations for life and death organ transplants. For anybody else, that alone will be an impressive life's work. But for Martine, it's just the latest in a long series of odds to find quests. Years ago, she envisioned a way to connect the whole world to the best in news and music, no matter how remote a listener might be. The result? Satellite radio, now known as Sirius XM. Next, as a lawyer with no pharmaceutical background, Martine drove the discovery of orphan drugs to save the life of her own daughter and thousands of others with, with once terminal diseases. She is an author, a lawyer, a helicopter pilot, and a green revolutionary. She has a brain of an engineer and the soul of a philosopher. And what could be more beautiful than that? After living the first half of her life as a male, Martine became the highest paid female CEO in the United States and the first openly transgender CEO of a public company. Wow, I don't know why I just got chills. To paraphrase Star Trek's old tagline, she goes where no one has gone before. And in honor of it being Pride Month, June, Martine, you are absolutely amazing. Let's go find her on Instagram or on Facebook. We need to connect. Amazing, amazing. Let me share with you a bit of Martine's amazing personal story. And then I'll explain in more depth the breakthrough she's making in the field of organ transplants. Why learn more about her? Question mark. Here's why. There are times when all of us face seemingly insurmountable challenges. Most of us accept these challenges part of, as part of life and do our best to manage our problems or suffering. But then there are people who create solutions and bring them to the world to help others. Martine is one of those. As you read the following pages, I'd ask you to think about the principles she follows to attack and solve the toughest problems. Because as already noted, these same principles will work for you in any area of your life, including your health. You don't have to take my word for this. 
Forbes put Martine on their list of a hundred greatest living business minds. Right next to Bezos, Buffett, and Bono, as Inc. Magazine exclaimed, she's breaking glass windows all over the place. Isabel, are you hearing this? Listen in. This is great. <laughs> Or as legendary futurist Ray Kurzweil put it, Martine has a perfect track record in turning her visions into reality. It's extremely rare to find someone so consistently inspirational across such a wide swath of human endeavor. When I do, I want to figure out what makes them tick. Here are two things I can tell you about Martine. First, she knows no fear. Least of all about being wrong, the person who makes no mistakes is making the biggest mistake, she says. The person who makes no mistakes is making the biggest mistake because they're, at, they're just standing still and doing nothing. Second, she's a serial obsessive and everybody loves it when Martine gets obsessed because it means that life on this earth is about to change for the better. As she told me at that Vatican, the world's biggest problems are the biggest opportunities. Going back to the time when Martine was still Martine Rothblatt, she was already the emperor of moonshots or what Peter Diamandis calls massively transformative purposes. From a very young age, she realized that it wasn't crazy to think you could do something that had never been done before. As I've always taught, if you want new answers, you've got to ask new questions and to ask them with the certainty that they need to be answered. Martine embodies the principle to a T. At every step, she's been dismissed by those in the know, but she shows us that no matter what anybody tells you, no matter how many roadblocks get, through, get thrown in your path, you keep digging until you reach your destination. You go full tilt, you liquidate doubt, you do not waver. Better than just about anyone I've ever met, Martine rejects what I call the tyranny of how. When most people have a dream or goal, they get excited until they start to confront how they're going to achieve it. Since they don't know how, they get demoralized. They lose the sense of certainty that breakthroughs require. Soon they stop trying, they give up, but Martine never gets discouraged by logistics. When something that matters is on the line, she decides that she'll find the solution. Even if all engineering details and logistics aren't quite ready for prime time, does that make sense to you too? I hope so, because no matter what your ambition may be, it's that kind of resolve and absolute persistence that fuels success. What is Martine obsessed about these days? What's driving her every living, breathing moment? Try this one for, for size. A world of organs on demand, where no one will ever need to die for the lack of a working lung, liver, kidney, or heart. Martine's certainty never wavers. Persistence is omnipotent, she says. If you don't give up, you will succeed. Organ regeneration is a fascinating field. It's literally sci-fi in the flesh. But before we dive into it, I wanna tell you a little more about the person who unflinching determination is making it happen today in real time. Yes, Martine, where are you? We wanna be friends with you. Okay, truth and technology will triumph over BS and bureaucracy. Renee Anselmo. Martine grew up feasting on the science, feasting on the science fiction of Arthur C. Arthur C. Clarke, the godfather of satellite communications. In the 1970s, as an adventurous 19-year-old taking a break from college, she traveled to the Zykeli's Islands off East Africa, where NASA had installed a tracking station for deep space missions. After climbing a mountain for a peak at the gigantic dish, she had a full-blown epiphany. It was like we stepped into the future. She began going, she began going to bed each night saying, if it's the last thing I'm going to do in my entire life, I'm going to connect the world with satellites. Flash forward a few years, Martine had her law and MBA degree from UCLA, 
with a focus on space law and finance. She joined Gerard K. O'Neill, the visionary Princeton physics professor as CEO of Geostar, a vehicular tracking system, an early version of today's GPS. Martine's big idea was that the same signals that track trucks and planes could also transmit sound. She spent too many hours on country back roads searching in vain for a jazz station. Or even more frustrating, having one fade into, into a dead zone just as one of her favorite artists came on. Then it came to her, why couldn't satellites be used to broadcast radio? Why couldn't listeners the world over get access to hundreds of crystal clear channels from anywhere they could see the sky? Why shouldn't people in Omaha or Reno get the same programming we take for granted in New York or DC or San Francisco? Martine is an engineer at heart. If you can't make it or build it, I'm not that interested in it. She did the math and knew her idea could work. As satellites kept getting bigger and more powerful, they'd be able to beam a signal to a flat little plate embedded in the roof of an automobile. That was Genesis of Sirius Satellite Radio, now Sirius XM. In our interview, Martine made clear how the vision met her three criteria, her three criteria for a legitimate moonshot. Ready for the three? Got your pen and paper? All right. One, the goal, in this case, a global satellite radio service could realistically be accomplished with a decade. Number two, it had the potential to transform society. My idea was to broadcast dozens of channels of content people can't get any other way into every city and town in North America to 10x blow the limit away. Number three, it was something that probably 99% of the population thought was impossible. It wasn't easy, it never is. When you're doing something original, Martine ran up against doubters at every turn. First, there were the experts who insisted that satellite radio signals could never reach a small planar antenna for more than 20,000 miles from Earth's surface, not if they had to pass through trees or get around tall buildings. Remember, this was before cell phones or commercial internet. Then there were the skeptics who said the Federal Com Communications Commission would never assign its valuable frequencies to an unproven satellite system. That included the National Association of Broadcasters, the terrestrial radio lobby. They were terrified of new competition and wanted to monopolize their frequencies for their electronic news gathering trucks. But Sirius aced the technology. In 1997, seven years after Martine founded the company, it received its FCC license. Still, the naysayers weren't done. There wasn't any market for subscription radio, they said. Who would pay for music and news and sports when they could get AM or FM for free? But as it turned out, lots of people who were ready to pay, especially after Howard Stern brought his show into the fold. Today, Sirius XM counts more than 30 million subscribers. As Martin shared with me at once at one of my business mastery seminars, she's met hundreds of people from all walks of life, from all corners of every country, who say that her brainchild helps them get through each and every day. She's been hugged by women in the most isolated places who can now connect to heartwarming talk media and a smorgasbord of musical genres. Thanks to over the air academic coursework, her pioneering technology enabled young people in India to get accepted to top universities. She extended Sirius XM to Africa and Asia via related companies and additional satellites. Martina is always gratified to hear these stories, but she wasn't surprised by Sirius XM success because she knew how much power and momentum a moonshot can generate. As she told me, you can construct the reality you desire when you have your massively transformative purpose. You know you're going to win before you actually win. The beautiful thing about the human mind is it's like a quantum computer. It can take in so much information and then just collapse into a solution right away. Martine 
Rothblatt, that's her last name, R-O-T-H-B-L-A-T-T. -T. Sirius was still getting off the ground when its creator launched another transformation, a personal one. Because Martine wasn't yet Martine, she was still Martine Rothblatt, though she long felt at odds with her label as a male. She'd bottle up her female side. I was super sensitive to not wanting to be laughed at, not wanting to be bullied, not wanting to lose any of my friends. Only Bina, her wife and soulmate, knew the truth before changing her name and gender. Martine consulted each of their four children. She gave each of them a veto. If they didn't want her to make the transition, she wouldn't go through with it. All four supported her choice. Genesis, just seven years old, pierced to the heart of it. I love my dad and she loves me. It was around that same time, that time that Martine and Bina noticed something not right with their youngest child. On a family ski trip in Telluride, Colorado, Genesis energy flagged and her lips kept turning blue. Black, back home, she had to be carried upstairs to her bedroom. They went to a doctor after a doctor and no one could say what was wrong. At the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC, they found out the Genesis had a rare and highly dangerous disease, pulmonary arterial hypertension. A narrowing of the arteries in her lungs was constricting her blood flow, straining her heart to pump hard enough. Her body was being starved of oxygen. Over the next couple of years, the doctors told them their daughter's heart muscle would weaken. Soon it would fail. Martine would never forget that day. I said to the doctor, surely there must be a cure, but there was no cure. Surely there must be a treatment. There was none, at least none that was safe and reliable. The lead physician, a specialist at the pinnacle of his profession, told them, every kid I've seen with this disease had died. Genesis was 10 years old and might have three years to live, five if she was lucky. Of course, she'd be added to the lung transplant list, but there were so few organs available, especially for children, that her chances were slim and none. Martine was devastated, but far from defeated because that was the day she set in motion her next moonshot to rescue her daughter. By then, she knew the most critical attribute for any successful entrepreneur, total immersion and single-minded obsession. Total immersion and single-minded obsession. She'd absorbed how to be able to twist that focus lens on your camera and everything else fades so blur and you're just targeting on what you have to do. I had to save Genesis, nothing else mattered. Martine stepped down as serious SEO or CEO. She put her life's great ambition and achievement behind her for something more urgent. She, told, she sold a chunk of her serious shares, established a foundation and funded 10 leading doctors to find a cure for pulmonary hypertension. Six months later, none of them had made a dent. Genesis was falling down and fainting, spending more nights at the hospital than out of it. Martine ran out of patience. There had to be a solution and she would find it herself. We're lucky to live in a time when anyone can become an expert in almost any subject, providing you know how to read and are willing to put in the effort. Martine decided to become an expert in pulmonary hypertension. It was an intern, it was an intellectual equivalent, she says, of a mother lifting up a Volkswagen to save her trapped child underneath the wheel. With Genesis in tow, Martine trekked to the libraries at Children's National Medical Center and the National Institute of Health. She read biology, physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, one book after the next. The more she learned, the more confident she became that she'd somehow find a way to treat this untreatable disease. Once again, the skeptics turned around, turned out in force. Martine had no training in the field. The top professionals kept reminding her, if an effective medicine was out there, wouldn't the real scientists have already found it? And even if she somehow stumbled onto something, 
Pulmonary hypertension was so rare that no one would invest in it. Where would the profits come from? Who would turn a scientific solution into a commercial product? Fortunately, Martine has a theory that kept her afloat. When you do something big and bold, it takes 99 no's to get to a yes. So let that sink in. And you need to welcome and embrace those no's because every one of them is one step closer to that yes. As she says, if you believe in what you do, you just got to be persistent. After months of digging, she struck gold in an unlikely spot, an article in an obscure journal about a drug developed to treat heart failure. The drug was a total bust, but it had an intriguing side effect. It reduced blood pressure between the heart and lungs, but nowhere else, which happened to be exactly what Martine was looking for. She went to the developer, Glaxo Welcome, now, which is Glaxo Smith Klein, and asked to buy their mysterious molecule. Three times they slammed the door in her face. The drug had been tried exclusively in congestive heart failure, and Glaxo didn't think it would, would work in pulmonary hypertension. Besides, they weren't about to license a failed medicine to a non-scientist. Finally, they had only a small amount of the drug left, past its expiration date. A possibly life-saving treatment for Genesis was sitting abandoned in the freezer, and that's where it would stay. A big punch of, bunch of no's in short, that's where another one of Martine's favorite saying comes in handy. Identify the corridors of indifference and run down them like hell. She needed credentials, question mark? Okay, she would get them. She recruited a team of doctors for downfield blocking and gradually wore Glaxo down. They agreed to license worldwide rights to the drug for $25,000 and 10% of any revenues it brought in, which they assumed would amount to zero. When the deal was done, they handed Martine a small amount of powder in a Ziploc bag with a pan recipe for, that perplexed the first several dozen chemists she consulted. But as you know by now, Martine doesn't take no for an answer. She ran down a retired pharma, pharmacologist, James Crow who thought he could make it work. In 1996, less than two years after Genesis was diagnosed, they founded United Therapeutics. Six years after that, around the time that Martine earned her PhD in medical ethics, they had an FDA-approved drug called Remojulin that proved all the naysayers wrong. She says the moonshot has landed. Remodulin wasn't a perfect drug. It had a short half-life and patients had to wear a bulky infusion pump around the clock, but it helped many of them stay alive, including Martine's daughter. United Therapeutics later developed an inhalable version and then a pill, Orenitrum, Martine Rowe spelled backwards. That's what they called it. Genesis is now 36 years old and living a full life as United Therapeutics telepresence and digital director. Meanwhile, the worthless powder, in quotes, that Martine licensed for $25,000 now generates more than 1.5 billion a year in revenue. Clinical trials have proven that it reduces morbidity and mortality due to pulmonary hypertension. In short, it has radically changed the outlook for this dreaded disease. Before United Therapeutics made this breakthrough drug available, only 2,000 people with pulmonary hypertension were alive in the U.S. The fatality rate was that high. Today, thanks to this new treatment, more than 50,000 people are managing the condition, the vast majority enjoying normal lives. If they can't afford the price of the drug, United Therapeutics provides it for free. As Martine says, that's a whole stadium of people who are living, not dying, with pulmonary hypertension. Beautiful people who have gone on to have children, to run the mayor, to become snowboard champions, you name it. Quite a success story, right? You might call it a happy ending, except that Martine was nowhere close to finish. UT Sweet, a medicine, slowed the progression of pulmonary hypertension, but they didn't stop it. For some, like Genesis, the results were dramatic. For others, including some of her daughter's close friends, there was only a brief reprieve before the end. 
Even today, 3,000 Americans die of pulmonary hypertension every year. For them and for anyone with other end-stage lung diseases like emphysema or COPD, there's no pharmaceutical cure, but there is a solution. All it took was another moonshot. Replacement lungs. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. You playing small does not serve the world. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Marianne Williamson. One million people in the United States today have an end, have an end stage organ disease. More than 100,000 are on the wait list for transplants, mainly for kidneys and hearts. Many thousands die each year before their name comes up. As humanity lives longer and cars get safer, reducing the number of donor organs after traffic accidents, the shortage keeps growing more acute. Even with six of 10 US adults registered as organ donors, the demand far outstrips the supply. It's especially dire for people with the end stage lung disease, which steals a quarter of a million lives each year. In 2019, there were all of 2,714 lung transplants. The chances of a person who needed a lung getting one was barely 1%. Those odds made no sense to Martine. She threw down the gauntlet at her 2015 TED Talk. If we keep cars and planes and buildings going forever with continuous maintenance and an unlimited store of parts, why can't we create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs to keep people living indefinitely? After all, you don't trash your car when you blow out a tire. You don't tear down your home when you need a new roof. If billions of people have naturally manufactured organs since time immemorial, not to mention all the animals in the animal kingdom, then why can't we do it too? The concept of synthetic organ violated no known laws of physics. At its root, Martine thought it was simply one more engineering problem. Lungs are fragile and complex pieces of anatomy. When a registered donor dies, the vast majority of lungs are ruled out by infections or degenerated disease. Among the few that take the first cut, 80% become filled with mucus and other fluids ruined by the process of death. Like the placenta salvaged by Bob Hariri, these precious gifts of life are being thrown into the trash. But Martine had another strategy to increase the number of healthy lungs available for transplantation. Building on the work of Dr. Shaf Keshavji, a surgeon at Toronto General Hospital, United Therapeutics established the world's first centralized lung restoration facility in Silver Spring. <clears throat> they began taking dead organs that had been rejected for transplantation because of their poor condition and pumping in special solutions to revive them under a glass dome that acted like an art, acting like an artificial body where they could last for up to 22 hours. <clears throat> wow. Toxic fluids and bacteria flushed out. Tears were repaired. Once a lung was stabilized, a bronchoscope sent real-time video to surgeons around the U.S. If the organ met their standards, it got cold packed and flown out for transplantation. In every single case that a surgeon remotely accepted a lung, according to Martine, the patients walked out of the hospital. I've met these people, she says. They're enormously grateful. They take me to their garage full of oxygen tanks and they say, we don't need these anymore. This technique, ex vivo lung perfusion or EVLP had been tried before, but never at the scale of United Therapeutics and its lung bioengineering PVC subsidiary. To date, the Maryland Center, a second UT branch at the Mayo Clinic campus in Jacksonville, Florida, and similar facilities elsewhere have saved many hundreds of patients. One of them is Heather Leverington, a former five-time National Collegiate Shot Put Champion by 2010, after a bout with lupus, she had begun needing oxygen to get through the day. Two years later, on a flight to Spain with her husband, she passed out. The diagnosis, pulmonary hypertension. She had a very, very aggressive case and blew through our medicines, Martine said. 
they were not able to slow down the disease. While she was still a young woman in her 30s, Heather's outlook seemed grim. <clears throat> in 2016, about to lose hope, received a call from a hospital in Pittsburgh. Would she be willing to join the United Therapeutics Clinical Trial and try a transplant with EVLP lungs? They didn't have to ask her twice. After the UT team revived a matched pair of lungs from a 28-year-old donor, Heather's 12-hour surgery was a resounding success. A year later, <clears throat> Heather won the gold medal in the shot put at the U.S. Transplant Games. Soon after, she became pregnant and gave birth to a healthy baby which isn't generally possible for people with pulmonary hypertension. Her disease was effectively cured. Xeno transplantation, Xeno transplantation, off the shelf organs. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead. One of the big impediments for any moonshot is that human beings aren't wired for super long-term objectives. Martine makes her magic happen by turning moonshots into a series of earth shots, tangible, practical, bite-sized milestones that can be reached within a year or so. She chunks things down. Then I carefully stack these one year sub projects, she says. And at the end of 10 years, we have something that seemed miraculous. For UT's moonshot to create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs, EVLP was their first earth shot, but by no means their final act. The more challenging a technology, Martine says, the more careful you have to be about hedging your bets. It's like diversifying a wealth portfolio among various asset classes. For maximum security, it's wiser to spread those eggs around in more than one basket. United Therapeutics has put Tiger teams to work on at least four different platforms for organ regeneration. These groups compete with one another and cooperate toward the larger goal at the same time. One frustration with EVLP is that the organs don't always get to patients in time. After a terrible car crash, say, or when a U.S. soldier in battle theater steps on a mine, the process relies on other people dying suddenly and ultimately deaths. It's unreliable, to say the least. And Martine wondered, why can't we build a pipeline of off-the-shelf organs to be ready at an hour's notice? One solution may be found in the humble pig in an interspecies exono transplant. By a fluke of nature, the organs of an adult pig are close to the size and shape of their human equivalents. Chimpanzees might be even closer, but they're a protected species. In the case of heart valves, where a tight fit is all important, porcine, pig donors, are already used for human patients. Americans eat about 130 million pigs a year. Just 1% of that would, be, would more than meet the country's entire demand for replacement organs. But there is a catch. Vicious hyperacute rejection within hours, if not minutes, of a xeno, xeno transplant. Pig organs provoke a massive and destructive immune response in humans, far more so than an organ from another person. For Martine, the problem was a thrilling opportunity. Why couldn't genetic engineering delete the pig proteins that trigger rejection? Why not humanize the pig? She teamed up with Craig Venter, the master of genomic sequencing, and invested in research on editing pig genomes with CRISPR, a relatively new but proven technology. What Time Magazine calls by far the most precise set of molecular tools to cut, paste, copy, and move genes around. You'll learn about the power of CRISPR and gene therapy in chapter nine. The partnership discovered that a 10 gene pig, an animal with a mere 10 problem genes knocked out or replaced by human DNA could do the trick. As Martine told the TED assembly, the TED assembly, this wasn't rocket science. It was straightforward engineering. 
taking on one gene at a time, not so different than our step-by-step -step approach in launching a communication satellite. The pigs are modified at a Virginia-based UT subsidiary called Ruvivicor, a spinoff of the British company that made Dolly the sheep, the first mam mammalian clone. In 2017, Martin's company agreed to fund university-based exotransplantation programs for pig hearts, kidneys, and lungs. Before long in preclinical trials, baboon recipients were setting survival records. By 2018, the University of Munich, they were lasting more than six months. FDA approval for human trials may not be far off. At the University of Alabama at Birmingham, researchers hope to transplant pig kidneys into adult pigs, to adults and pig hearts into struggling newborn child, children, if only to buy them more time before human organs become available. We've got a Chevy, says Devin Ekhoff, the former director of UAB's breakthrough program. We may even have a BMW now. Do we wait for a Ferrari, question mark? There's a point where you just want to give it a test drive. Martin is aiming to kick off clinical trials for exno kidneys by 2023. I know folks needing kidneys I'm trying to save, she says. And for exeno hearts by 2025, she's confident that pig organ transplants for human patients will be an FDA approved reality before the 2020s are out. What most people thought was impossible, they're now realizing is inevitable. If you're wondering how fast this can happen, I'll give you a clue. As I was doing the final edits of this chapter, I received a text from Martine. And she said this, Tony, as promised at your Palm Beach Business Mastery event, but they linked to two reports, one from ABC News and the other from the New York Times reporting a breakthrough news story of the first time a pig kidney was transplanted into a human without triggering an immediate re rejection and in fact looked like a normal kidney the following day. The procedure was done at NYU, Lagone Health in New York City, and is a fruit fruition of Martine's work developed by United Therapeutics. This experiment has shattered yet another obstacle in the way of organ transplant shortage, and researchers are already thinking of implications in other organ systems like skin and heart valves. Thanks to the work of eGenesis, an ambitious startup spun out of the Harvard Lab of Legendary Genetics, and our Life Force advisor, George Church, FDA approval no longer seems like such a long shot. The company's co-founder, Lu Han Yang, figured out a way to make 62 simultaneously genetic edits in the pig genome, enough to strip away all of the viruses that normally reside in the genome and could possibly infect people after a transplant. The company recently tested its virus-free pig organs in primates at Massachusetts General with impressive results. The primates survived for nine months post-transplant with a clear path to reaching more than a year. Other superstar scientists are attacking the problem from other angles. At the, at the Salk Institute in California, under Juan Carlos Espisua Belmonte, researchers are working to cultivate human organs inside pigs via human stem cells. According to James Markman, Mass General Chief of Transplant Surgery, everybody sees that we're at a turning point, as the Atlantic noted. Routine pig to human transplants could truly transform healthcare beyond simply increasing the supply. Organs would go from a product of chance, someone young and healthy dying unexpectedly to the product of a standardized manufacturing process. Organ transplants would no longer have to be emergency surgeries requiring planes to deliver organs and surgical teams to scramble at any hour. Organs from pigs can be harvested on a schedule and surgeries planned for exact times during the day. A patient that comes in with kidney failure could get a kidney the next day, eliminating the need for large dialysis centers. Hospitals, ICU beds will no longer be taken up by patients waiting for a heart transplant. Like Martine Doc Church, Dr. Church's company, eGenesis, is also working to solve the organ shortage crisis with modified pig organs. eGenesis is focused first on kidneys and pancreatic islet cells, though heart, lungs, and livers won't be far behind. But Church is ready to take this revolution one step further. 
We're looking to create enhanced organs to produce something that is better than we have in the body. He says, Dr. Church imagines organs that can fend off bacterial or viral infections or the deterioration of aging. Some people might have issues with this kind of human engineering, but if it means getting lungs as strong as Michael Phelps or a heart like Usain Bolt, why not? We're doing this by making pigs more human-like from a molecular standpoint, making them immune tolerant and eliminating the internal retroviruses in the pigs, says Church. We call them pig 3.0. And we've already produced 2,000 of these animals for preclinical primate organ transplant trials. The primates receiving the donor organs are surviving over 300 days thus far at Massachusetts General Hospital. It hopefully won't be very long before we switch from the primates to clinical human trials. Though Martine shares a growing excitement over ex exno transplants, she also pursuing preclinical trials with parallel op options. Even after a pig organ is humanized, she points out, it can provoke the same long-term rejection issues as transplants from people. In other words, recipients would still need immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of their lives. Beyond some unpleasant side effects, these medications can open the door to infections or cancers. For non-emergency end-stage scenarios where patients have a year or more to find a life-saving replacement, United Therapeutic is working on a third platform, building organs from scratch, using the patient's own stem cells for tissue regeneration. Here's how it works. They start with a donor's pig's lungs and strip all the living cells. What's left is a structural framework, a scaffold of collagen, the basis protein building block for most human tissues and organs. The beautiful thing about collagen, no matter its source, is that it's non-reactive. It causes zero immune responses or rejection. Next, the scaffold is recellularized with either billions of human lung type cells or the recipient's own induced pluripotent stem cells or IPSCs, which you might recall from chapter two. Derived from adult skin cells, an IPSC is reprogrammed to mimic an embryonic stem cell. It then follows instructions to become whatever type of tissue is needed. Or as Martine explains, you can turn back it, it, you can turn it back in time to becoming a stem cell. And then you can roll it back forward specifically to be a cardiac cell or an alveolar cell from the lung. Since the replacement organ would match the recipient's DNA, no immunosuppressants would be needed. The last time we checked, UT's assembly line was churning out 500 humanized lung scaffolds per year. The IPSC approach is a huge step toward personalized regenerative medicine, but in Martine's big picture, it's just one more earth shot. Her ultimate moonshot involves on demand organs that will be custom designed start to finish. Easily scalable, the technology will make conventional transplants obsolete. Woo! Amazing. I don't know about you. Who else is mind blown right now? Amazing. Amazing. Let me know in the comments like this, share it with somebody. Such an inspiring story, such an inspiring person. Like, amazing. I'm absolutely inspired. I'm pumped up, excited. This is unbelievable what's taking place. And what one person with commitment or wanting to transform different specific places in, in the world that are problems, like it's absolutely possible you know, when you don't just quit and there's always a way, there is always a way, no matter what everybody else says, there is always a way if you want it bad enough and you're committed to it and you're persistent enough, whatever goals, whatever dreams you have, whatever that vision is for your life, it is absolutely more, more than possible. I'm super excited. I believe in you. I'm so glad you were able to listen in with me and read this particular chapter. We're not done yet. That concluded the read with me session, but we're gonna start back up on uh, page 140.
at the bottom, it's 3D printed organs. It's still the same chapter, but we're gonna go into 3D printed organs. If you got value from this video, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Share this again with somebody. Hit subscribe if you're not subscribed so you can uh, definitely get notified when the next Read With Me session comes. All right. Hope you have a beautiful, amazing rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Appreciate you. Love you. The best is yet to come. Take care.